Uh, so good morning, everybody, and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for the introduction. Um, before I get into my talk, I'd like to just say it's a real honor to uh, have been selected for one of the early career uh, researcher spotlights and to be able to stand here in front of you today to present to uh, an international audience of aluminum experts. And what I want to share with you guys today is some of my recent work, which looks at using the process of warm forming to enable the next generation of automotive heat exchangers and to explore the relationship between warm forming and brazing. I'm sure at some point uh, in our lives, we all either had the misfortune of being this guy or maybe you've driven past him on the side of the highway, steam coming out from under his hood. And you know, if you're anything like me, as you drove by, you might think, you know, poor guy. And for a very brief moment in time, you had a much deeper appreciation for the need for properly functioning automotive heat exchangers. And it turns out that these next generation heat exchangers are also an enabling technology in the emerging electric vehicle market. And for example, a number of battery cooling plates, such as the two designs that we can see here, are used within a vehicle's battery pack, where the cooling plates are sandwiched between the individual battery cells, and they circulate a coolant through these series of channels in the plates to extract the heat which is generated by the batteries and allows us to achieve peak driving performance. And if we look at the production of these plates, they're uh, fabricated by stamping the series of half channels into each uh, into individual aluminum alloy sheets. We then place the sheets together and pass the assembly through a furnace uh, to be brazed. Uh, but due to the very thin nature of the sheets which we're using this, we, we require very strict uh, process controls for both forming and brazing and uh, failure due to, corros uh, to corrosive attack is of, uh, is of growing concern. So we take a slightly closer look at these materials which we're using in the production of these heat exchangers. It turns out that they're actually a laminate structure, which I'll refer to as uh, aluminum brazing sheets. And we can see that they're comprised of at least two uh, aluminum alloy layers. And the first is the core alloy, which is the thicker of the two layers. And it's often a manganese rich 3000 series, which remains solid throughout the processing of the heat exchanger. And it provides strength in the life cycle requirements to the assembly. And the second layer is the clad alloy. And this is always a 4000 series, which due to the high silicon content uh, has a liquidous temperature, which is substantially below the solidest temperature of the core. And what this means is that when we pass the assembly through the furnace for brazing, this cloud layer will completely melt and will provide uh, filler metal for the, uh, the numerous braze joints throughout our assembly. And for all the work I'll be sharing today, uh, we used a brazing sheet with an overall thickness of uh, just 200 microns with a single cloud layer of about 10% of the total sheet thickness. And these sheets were uh, industrially produced and supplied in both the fully annealed O and the work hardened H24 sheet tempers. And what we're showing here is a very simple representation of uh, braze joint formation uh, when we use these brazing sheets. So on the left here, we can see two sheets which have been formed uh, into the required geometry. They've been placed together to form a joint mating surface here. And then when we heat this assembly above the clad alloy liquidus temperature, the clad alloy at the surface of the sheet will melt and due to surface tension and capillary forces will flow toward the, the uh, mating surface and upon solidification will form these braze joints all throughout the assembly. And within the braze joint, we can see that the main phases which are present are the alpha dendrites and the aluminum silk and eutectic uh, structure, which we'd expect for cooling for a 4000 series. But recently, uh, it was uncovered that there's two major form, uh, material formability issues when we started to make these new heat exchanger designs, and we'll look at those uh, now. And the first one was that the, the heat exchanger design and ultimately the performance of the assembly was limited by the brazing sheet material formability. But some of my colleagues at the University of Waterloo had shown that when we begin to increase the temperature that these sheets are formed at, we can get a significant improvement in the formability, as we can see in the plot here on the right. Or, for example, by increasing the forming temperature to 250 degrees, they found a total uh, elongation increase of uh, three times. And what this means is that it allows us to develop new heat exchanger designs. So, for example, in the image on the top right, we can see a heat exchanger component, which cannot be formed at room temperature without cracking, was able to be formed in a single forming step without failure when we increase the forming temperature to 300 degrees. And the second major forming issue that they had found was that uh, when they formed sheets of higher initial strength, the sheet suffered a significant amount of spring back, uh, 
which led to poor component flatness and dimensional control. And what this means for the heat exchanger assemblies is uh, we can see that in the top image here, which is two of these battery cooling plates, which have simply been clipped together. But due to the spring back, we have these large gaps forming on either side of the assembly, making the formation of brace joints at these locations uh, difficult to achieve. But again, my colleagues had shown that by increasing the forming temperature, we were able to significantly reduce the spring back. Uh, and this is particularly true for the higher initial sheets, uh, such as the H, uh, H temper sheets. So it seemed that warm forming was a promising technique, which would allow us to expand heat exchanger design possibilities and enable us to use sheets of higher initial strength. But all these past studies only looked at uh, the forming temperature and had not given any consideration to how this change in forming might impact uh, subsequent brazing and corrosion performance. And it turns out that this might be a critical gap in our materials processing knowledge because it's known that during brazing, detrimental interactions between the liquid clad and the solid core can occur. Uh, and one, one of these interactions, which is particularly important for strain brazing sheet, is this phenomenon of liquid film migration, where during brazing, the liquid clad alloy can penetrate the solid core along the grain boundaries, forming a liquid film at the boundary, which is then able to migrate. And as this film begins to migrate, it dissolves the core alloy in the second phase particles, impairing the mechanical integrity of the sheet, and it re-precipitates an aluminum silicon solid solution behind the film, depleting the amount of liquid clad available to form braze joints. And after, we, and after the heat exchanger is cooled and the film solidifies, we're left with this microstructure that we can see in the top, where we have a non-recrystallized core alloy and these large blocky grains present at the surface, which are protruding into the core. And, it's left, and it also leaves a band of intermetallic particles at the interface, which increases the sheet susceptibility to corrosive attack. It's been shown in a number of past studies that the extent of this uh, LFM uh, process depends on the amount of strain which is imparted to the sheet prior to brazing. So one example is from one of my past studies where we measured the rate that liquid clad alloy would be depleted as a function of strain, which you can see here in this plot. And while I won't go into exactly how we measured this parameter, what we can see is that the rate of liquid clad loss begins to increase with applied strain up to the point uh, where the core alloy recrystallized during brazing. And the reason for this is that it's been shown that core alloy recrystallization will eliminate the stored deformation energy in the core, which is the driving force for that LFM process. So given the dependence of this uh, interaction on the amount of applied strain, it's important that we understand how a change in the forming conditions might impact uh, subsequent brazing performance. Uh, and that's exactly what I've been doing over the last few years, is trying to understand this relationship between the initial sheet conditions, such as the sheet temper, the forming temperature, and the applied strain to the sheet. Uh, and in all of these past studies, what we've been doing, we've, we've uh, simplified warm forming by performing interrupted tensile tests uh, in a furnace using simple uniaxial test specimens, performing uh, simulated brazing trials, and then predicting the brazing performance. And from these initial studies, we were able to take away a few uh, key insights. And the first of which is that we found that when we increased the forming temperature to 250 degrees for a fully annealed O temper sheet, we found that there was a distinct change in the rate of, clad, of liquid clad alloy depletion as a function of strain. Uh, and we also found that this increased rate of liquid cloud loss was correlated with um, uh, a greater susceptibility to this LFM process and a higher uh, level of applied strain required to trigger, to trigger recrystallization uh, in the core alloy. So from all of these observations, we made the initial prediction that the brazing performance of these warm-formed uh, warm O-temper sheets would be impaired relative to room temperature formed sheet. On the other hand, when we, when we performed the exact same measurements on sheets initially in the H24 temper, we found that not only was the rate of uh, cloud depletion not dependent on applied strain, we also found that it was insensitive to an increase in the forming temperature up to 250 degrees. And if we look at the, the post braze micrographs from these samples, uh, we can see that the core alloy had recrystallized at all levels of applied strain due to the prior cold work imparted to the sheet. And as a result, we had uh, none of that LFM occurring. Uh, and so from these predictions, or from, from these observations, we had predicted that the brazing performance of sheets initially in the H24 temper would be unaffected by an increase in the forming temperature. But all the past studies I had performed had only predicted the brazing performance. Uh, and if, uh, based on micrographs, uh, these 
metallography and uh, these other indirect indicators. But if warm forming is to be a true manufacturing uh, route or viable manufacturing route, these predictions needed to be checked, which is the focus of the next few slides and the remainder of this talk. So to check these predictions, uh, my co-authors and I developed this custom um, tooling, which allowed us to form scaled down uh, battery cooling plates in our lab using just a simple tensile tester. And by instrumenting the tooling with some thermocouples, heaters, and water cooling, we were able to accurately control our forming temperature and allow us to form these, um, these scaled down plates in our lab between room temperature and 250 degrees. So you can see the resultant form geometry in the image here on the right, where we have a number of uh, form features which are of interest, which include the channel and an inlet to circulate our coolant, a number of ribs, which add some stiffness to our plate, and a number of dimples, which prevent collapse of these channels during brazing, and they turbulize the coolant as it circulates. And after we form these plates, we, take, we took two of the, or we clean the surface of the plates to remove any residual lubricants, uh, place two of the plates together into a custom uh, uh, fixture, clamp the assembly together, and pass it through a furnace uh, for brazing. And after the, the plates were removed from the furnace for brazing, we assessed their performance at both the component and the microstructural levels. So at the component level, the first thing we did was check for the, uh, for the presence of any leaks in these plates. And we did this by attaching air lines to these fittings over in the channels uh, and pressurizing the plates. And we found that all the plates that we had brazed in the study were leak-free, at least up to 40 PSI, which, uh, which demonstrated the integrity of the overall plate design and the continuity of braze joints at the edges of our plates. We also performed this 2D radiography to assess the uh, formation of braze joints within the plates. Um, and we can see two example radiographs here where the braze fillet formation appears as, the lo as these localized darker regions due to more material being present there. So for example, within each one of these channels, we can see a number of uh, dark rings, which indicates uh, fully brazed dimples all throughout our channels. And with the exception of a few instances of inconsistent braze fillet formation and some irregular cloud pooling at the edges of the plates, uh, we were able to successfully braze plates from all sheet temper and forming temperature combinations. And there was no clear difference between the different conditions that we had, uh, we had looked at. Next, we can look at the microstructural evolution of the plates. And in this case, these were taken from uh, the ribs of plates uh, from O-temper sheets formed at both room temperature uh, and 250 degrees. And we can see that here in the, the braised fillets, uh, we have the uh, dendrite, dendrite formation and eutectic structure present as we'd expect. But we can also see that the core alloy in each of the sheets uh, the, is not uh, homogeneous along the joint, along the length of the joint. So to facilitate the analysis of this, this microstructural evolution, one of my co-authors had developed a finite element model of our battery plate, and, and this allowed us to predict, not only predict the strains uh, throughout, the, throughout the plate, but it also allowed us to correlate some of our current findings in the plates with our past findings from our uniaxial specimens. So when we look at areas of higher strain, such as here at the, the radius of the rib, we found these very large, uh, coarse and elongated recrystallized grains uh, in the core with the primary solidification phase growing uh, from their surface. But when we looked at the uh, regions of relatively low strain, such as at the mating surface of these ribs, we found that not only do we have a non-recrystallized core alloy, but we can also see from this image on the right, we have a, large, a number of these large blocky grains which are protruding uh, into, this, into the core alloy, which are very characteristic of that liquid fill migration phenomenon I, I talked about. So overall, the microstructural evolution that we're seeing within these plates was very well correlated with our past studies uh, in terms of uh, the microstructures we expect at, at certain levels of strain. But if you'll recall, I'd, I'd said we had predicted that the brazing performance of warm-formed O-temper sheet uh, would be impaired due to more rapid liquid cloud depletion because of this LFM. But we can see from this image here on the right uh, that despite LFM being present at the joint location, we're still able to form uh, full braced fillet. And so as we move from these simple uniaxial uh, specimens that we used to predict brazing performance to these more complex form geometries and assemblies, we need to take into account these secondary effects such as surface tension 
and capillary forces, which are going to draw the liquid clad from the surrounding region and provide the necessary joint, or provide the necessary filler metal to, to form these fillets at the joint locations. Uh, and then just the, uh, the last results slide, which I'll show here, uh, is, was taken from uh, some braised dimples in the plates, from plates formed from the H24 sheet at both room temperature and 250 degrees. And again, we can see that within the, the braised fill itself, we have the uh, alpha dendrites, or the primary solidification phase, and the eutectic structure in between, as we'd expect. But we can also see in this case, through the core alloy along the length of the joint, the core alloy is, the grain structure is more homogeneous, that at all locations we have a slightly coarsened, recrystallized grain structure, and that was present in both, for both, for sheets formed at both room temperature and 250 degrees. So we, were, we didn't see any obvious differences when we increased the forming temperature for these sheets as well. And just a quick summary of the, some of the key takeaways from this talk today. And the first is that warm forming, my colleagues have shown that warm forming is a promising manufacturing technique which could be used to enable or allow us to form the next generation of automotive heat exchangers by expanding design possibilities and allowing us to use sheets of higher initial strength. But these studies have not considered uh, the effect that the increase in forming temperature might have on brazing performance. So the work that I've been showing here today, the past few studies I've been doing, are the first to explore this relationship. Uh, the second is that, well, the, uh, many of the predictions from these past studies using the uniaxial specimens were uh, correct. Uh, in particular, the relationship between applied strain and the post braze microstructure. Uh, they weren't able to to necessarily predict the actual brazing performance. And that's because in our simple uniaxial specimens, we didn't have these secondary effects like surface tension and capillary forces, which will pull the liquid clad, and so it couldn't predict the actual brazing performance. And then lastly, in the current study, uh, the full benefits of the warm forming process weren't necessarily demonstrated using the scaled down geometry, because we were actually able to form the geometry at room temperature. Uh, and we were actually able to successfully braze H24 plates formed at room temperature. But what the current results did show is that the warm forming process doesn't negatively impact our brazing performance and thus could be considered a viable uh, route for he uh, automotive heat exchanger production. And so uh, it's my hope that uh, my research will help us to enable the next generation of automotive heat exchangers so that we may all avoid ending up like this poor guy here. And I'd like to thank you for your time.